Wow, we all came to attention very quickly. <laughs> Bonsoir. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special event at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights right here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Thank you for joining us here, and I'd also like to welcome all those watching via live stream. Bonsoir et bienvenue tout le monde à cette activité très spéciale au Musée canadien pour les droits de la personne ici à Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Merci d'être présent et à tous et toutes qui participent par diffusion en direct, bienvenue. Simultaneous interpretation is available. If you haven't done so already, you can pick up a headset at the back of the room. Channel one is English to French translation. Channel two is French to English translation. Une service d'interprétation simultanée est offert. Si ce n'est pas déjà fait, vous pouvez prendre un casque d'écoute à l'arrière de la salle. La chaîne 1 est pour la traduction de l'anglais au français et la chaîne 2 est pour la traduction du français à l'anglais. And to my left are our ASL interpreters. If you do require ASL interpretation, I invite you to sit down in the front row. Alors je vous demande si vous avez besoin de service de langage de signes de vous prendre place ici à ma gauche. I would like to start first by acknowledging that we here in Winnipeg and in the museum are located on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory in the heartland of the Métis people. J'aimerais avant tout reconnaître que nous sommes sur des terres ancestrales visées par le traité numéro 1 et au cœur du territoire de grande importance pour les Métis. This evening, we will be hearing a keynote by the Right Honorable Kim Campbell, followed by a moderator question and answer session. And why? because tomorrow marks 100 years since Canadian women achieved an important victory in their struggle for democratic rights, and it happened here in Manitoba. On January 28, 1916, just a few blocks from here, the provincial government passed the first legislation in Canada that enshrined women's rights to vote. Tonight, we're very pleased to mark this anniversary when women in Manitoba first won the right to vote, it was and is a major achievement. We still do need to remember that it wasn't the end of the fight. Many women continued to be denied their democratic rights and even to be legally recognized as persons. Many continued to be denied the right to vote not only because of their gender, but also because of race, ethnicity, religion, or disability. It was followed by decades of struggle by many groups. It wasn't actually until 1960 that First Nations men and women who were status Indians finally got the right to vote. And in 2004, when prisoners were finally permitted to vote. And that is when all women in Canada could participate in elections. Women's rights in Canada have come a long way in the last 100 years, but there is still work to be done in the galleries of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, you will find dozens of stories about the past, present, and future of women's rights. Many are told through the personal perspective of the people who lived these experiences. Les droits de la femme au Canada ont fait bien du chemin au cours des cent dernières années, mais il y a encore beaucoup de pain sur la planche. Dans les galeries du Musée canadien pour les droits de la personne, on trouve des dizaines d'histoires au sujet du passé, du présent et de l'avenir des droits de la femme. Beaucoup de ces histoires sont racontées du point de vue des personnes qui les ont vécues. All of these stories have played a role in telling us how people have broke down barriers and challenge inequality. And so has our guest tonight. When the Right Honorable Kim Campbell became Canada's first, and still only, female Prime Minister in 1993, it was an historic occasion. The path forged by Nellie McClung and the suffragettes of 1916 had ultimately cleared the way for a woman to hold this country's highest office. But it also showed how far we have yet to go, which is something I'll let her talk to you about in her own words. Kim Campbell has spent much of her life breaking down barriers, starting at the age of 16 when she became the first female student body president of her high school. 
Elle a passé une grande partie de sa vie à faire tomber des barrières. Elle a commencé dès l'âge de 16 ans quand elle est devenue la première présidente du conseil étudiant de son école secondaire. Le voyage est loin d'être terminé et Kim Campbell travaille encore à tracer le chemin. The journey towards equality is far from over. And Kim Campbell is still working to clear the way. Tomorrow, Ms. Campbell will join the Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba, Janice Philman, and nine other leaders who will be working to inspire a group of 100 young people to stay vigilant on behalf of human rights, democratic rights, women's rights. We are so grateful that she could travel here tonight and share her own thoughts about the past 100 years and where we need to go from here. Sans plus attendre, je vous présente la très honorable Kim Campbell. Without further ado, please join me in warmly welcoming the Right Honorable Kim Campbell. Thank you very, very much. Merci mille fois. On m'a demandé d'ajouter de temps en temps un peu de français, et même que je parle français comme une Vancouveroise, je vais l'essayer. Uh, ça me fait grand plaisir d'être ici. It's a long time since I've been in Winnipeg, and it's wonderful to be here. And over the years, I'd heard about this wonderful museum, and to have an opportunity to see it, uh, not just its architectural magnificence, but also the, uh, the way the content is displayed. It's, it's beautiful. It's challenging, it's disturbing, and it's essential. It's a very uh, valuable and fundamental part of Canada's resources to understand ourselves yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So I'm really pleased to have a chance to be here. And <clears throat> you know, it is a big deal. Tomorrow, 100 years since the Manitoba legislature passed legislation not only to give women the vote, but to give them the right to hold public office. And you all know the story that just before the vote was to go to the legislature, somebody noticed that it didn't include the provision to hold public office, and some last minute lobbying was done to amend the legislation. Because the people understood that what needed to happen was not just women having a chance to vote, but also to hold public office, although it took some time for that to happen. And it is a big deal, and tonight I want to talk a little bit about why it is a big deal and what I've learned about it in my own life. One of the things I would say right from the start is that when you read about the women who succeeded in getting the legislation to enfranchise them, passed by the Manitoba legislature, they were very active and had a very developed life in what we now call civil society. There were organizations, there were clubs, there were movements. These were not women who were alienated from society, who were without resources. But they understood a fundamental message, and one that sometimes gets lost even today. And that is that there is no substitute for political power, the right to vote, and the right to participate in political action, the right to participate in governance. I'm concerned today that when one looks at the decline in Canadian voter turnouts, and the last election may, may uh, have dispelled some of that. It was a very interesting uh, campaign, a long campaign that had a good, very big turnout. But if you look at the, the decline in voter turnout in Canada, the, the decline is almost always among young people. That us old geezers, we're still voting at the same rate that we ever did. But young people are not. And it's not because they're not active. It's not because they're not engaged. It's because they do not recognize how important it is to have some say in what, uh, I think it was David Easton, a political scientist who, whom I read when I was a young undergraduate, called the authoritative allocation of values. The decisions that governments make at any level may bind us. They are integral to the structures that, that compel certain kinds of behavior, prohibit other certain kinds of behavior. What is a rule of law? It's not a country with a lot of laws. Lots of dictatorships have lots of laws. The rule of law is law that compels everyone in the society, that binds everyone from the highest to the lowest. And so the making of those laws 
and the governance structures that engage in those activities is fundamental in a democracy. Yes, civil society is great, and the capacity for societies to organize spontaneously is one of the hallmarks of democracy and freedom and freedom of association and confidence and, and literacy and all of those things that make people confident to go out and try and solve their own problems. But the women in Manitoba in 1916 understood that forming organizations, creating opportunities to communicate wasn't enough that they needed the vote, and we still need the vote. And in terms of human rights, what the vote does is the vote recognizes our individual status, our individual right to participate. It is an individual endowment. We may exclude people in collective ways, and that is something that's very concerning and something that over the years we've tried to deal with in our society, not to exclude certain categories. But the right to vote is something that each one of us has as an individual Canadian citizen and that we can exercise in any way we wish without compunction. So when we look at that, it is a remarkable step. And we take it for granted. It's actually a sign of how free and successful our democratic society is, that we can look back 100 years and say, oh, isn't that great? But we need to take time to savor what that meant and that it was such a qualitative change in the opportunities available to those remarkable women who had already demonstrated their capacity to have impact on the society, to organize and communicate. When I was a young girl, I'm a post-war baby boomer, uh, I was raised by parents, both of whom had been in uniform in World War II. My mother horrified her mother by enlisting in the Navy and she trained to be a wireless telegrapher. Uh, and she was posted, first of all, to, she was sent to Halifax, then she was sent to Santia South to train, and she was posted uh, for part of the time just outside Ottawa in Gloucester, which was a separate city then. You had to be someplace where there were no steel uh, bars in the building to interfere with the, the radio transmissions. Now, what my mother did what, as a Wren was to uh, sit long watches scanning to try and intercept the transmissions of German U-boats in the North Atlantic and Gulf of St. Lawrence. And those submarines actually came up right off Quebec City. And so when I was a little girl growing up, we had pictures in our house of my dad in his army uniform and my mother in her naval uniform. And incidentally, she was quite adorable. And I think she lied about her age. I think she enlisted when she was only 17, but she was already out of high school and she wanted to do something meaningful. And I think that had an impact on me growing up, this idea of living a life outside my normal everyday life, trying to do something that had some significance. And for my mother, she often said that those years wearing the king's uniform were among the most meaningful of her life, that they were very important. And my mother raised my sister and me to believe that girls could do anything, but to understand that it was not a universally accepted proposition. And we were raised on the wonderful Charlotte Witten state, statement that a woman had to be twice as good as a man in order to be thought half as good, but fortunately that's easy. Um, it's interesting how that having to be twice as good in order to be seen as, as equal has been confirmed over and over again in, in modern times um, by, by empirical example. For example, when um, people became interested in the role of women in science after Larry Summers made his unfortunate comment when he was president of Harvard a few years ago that maybe the reason why women weren't in science was that they weren't really so interested and didn't have the same aptitudes and he was totally oblivious to the kinds of barriers that women scientists encountered. And there was an article in the New York Times about universities who had been trying to increase the number of women in tenure track positions in their faculties of science. And I'd interviewed a man at University of Michigan, and he said, you know, I was invited to be part of a committee to try and increase the number of women. And I thought, oh, it's just a generational thing. It's the old guys. You know, when they're retired, you know, this, the problem will solve itself. And he said, but then I went to a presentation about gender bias, and I was absolutely dumbfounded. Because he discovered that panels of men and women would require a woman to have twice as many or two and a half times as many publications as a male candidate to be seen as an equal candidate. And this wasn't just men, men and women. In other words, the assumption 
that women have to be so much better in order to be seen as equals. Similarly, women who seek to have uh, letters of recommendation from their, their thesis advisors get much shorter letters than men get. Men get letters that are much more specific, much more focused on the actual requirements of the job. Women's letters often include uh, terms that, that, you know, hard worker is a lovely one. You know, we all want to be hard workers, but for when a woman is called a hard worker, it's usually a, 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 a negative compliment that means, well, she's not very smart, and if she seems to be doing well, it's just because she works harder than anybody else. So the point is, these issues are out there. But when I was a young girl, I was very optimistic, and I wanted to make a difference, and I was curious. And I was particularly interested in the state of the world because as a post-war baby boomer, uh, I grew up in an era when television was full of documentaries about World War II. And some of you will remember the world at war narrated by Sir Lawrence Olivier. And every time I would hear it, I'd go running into the living room to watch it because it just fascinated me. And I read books about the Holocaust because I was trying to get my head around these extraordinary events that had taken place before I was born. And so, I really wanted to make a life where I could do something about it, where I could make some kind of contribution to prevent such a terrible thing from happening again. And uh, so I wanted to contribute to world peace, and since I wasn't likely to be a contestant in the Miss America contest, where they all said they want to work on world peace, I thought of something else. And when I was a teenager, my ambition was to be the first woman Secretary General of the United Nations. Now, I'll come back to that uh, at, the, at the end of my remarks. But the reason was simply that I, you know, I wanted obviously to be the first woman. I wanted to break down a barrier for women, and I wanted to do something significant on the world stage. Well, eventually I did other things. I studied international relations and Soviet government, and then I went into politics and changed career path. But when I was a young woman uh, applying for graduate school, uh, it was my first encounter with some of the barriers that women face, because what I found was that Everybody wanted to know, was I just going to get a, an advanced degree and then drop out and have children and not use my education? And women of my generation trying to get accepted into these kinds of programs, and incidentally, women were not eligible for Rhodes Scholarships when I was uh, graduating from university. It was about another eight or nine years. So those kinds of wonderful caches that gave men instant uh, credibility and recognition were simply not available to women. And I often think of the Clintons. Hillary Clinton was actually a much more outstanding student than Bill was at the time, but he's a Rhodes Scholar. She wasn't because there were no Rhodes Scholarships for women. But we really had to push, you know, please, please give us a chance. We'll prove our merit. Then I remember after I came back from graduate school, I was teaching at the University of British Columbia. And there was a woman uh, in the faculty. Uh, she was a sessional lecturer as women often were, and she gave a presentation. She, was, she did Canadian politics, and she gave a presentation about the value of a woman's perspective in political science, and she talked about different things that they, they looked at and some of the different questions that they had. And the chair of our department, who was a very distinguished scholar, just was quite irritated, and he said, I just don't get, I mean, what is the value what, I mean, what is this? What is the value of a woman's perspective in political science? So in those days, the notion that a woman's voice or a woman's perspective or a woman's way of doing things might add a dimension to something was not very welcome. Uh, that there was this idea that there were scholarly disciplines, you know, that the law was this wonderful thing that came down crystalline from on high, and it had no, you know, tawdry biases or reflections of anything that needed to be addressed by social criticism, that it was somehow, you know, we should all, it applied to all of us, and it was magnificent in its all-encompassing uh, nature. So for a period of my life, I saw the challenge of trying to create a recognition of and a respect for the kinds of questions that women often asked in, in certain circumstances, and issues that came to be called women's issues. Over the years, notwithstanding these discouragements, women pressed on, they pursued, they did graduate degrees, they studied law, they studied medicine. And in 1983, when the equality provisions of the charter were, were implemented, women had uh, a particular 
tool that they could use to challenge legislation, to challenge practices, particularly in government and public institutions, that they thought were unfair. But interestingly enough, there were also inter things happening in the United States. And in 1972, the American Congress passed something called Title IX. And Title IX at the time, I actually knew uh, Rich Bai, who was, who, who was one of the sponsors of that. I met him later. And I'm not sure people even realized how significant it was going to be, but Title IX had as one of its uh, implications that American universities and schools that got federal funding for athletics had to provide equal funding for women's sports as to men's sports. Now, in 1972, if I had been a member of the American Congress, I'm not sure I would have voted for that because I think I might have assumed, like many people did, that boys were more interested in sports than girls were or that men were more interested than women. But what Title IX did is it created a revolution and a dramatic increase in the number of women at American colleges and universities who wanted to play sports. And it taught a very important lesson. You cannot judge what people either can do or want to do by what they do do. If you take current behavior as being an indication of what's normal, you are ignoring the fact that the current situation may reflect a whole variety of constraints and barriers and discouragements, and that the things that people choose to do may be the things they choose to do within the context of what's possible. But if you lift that veil, if you suddenly say, yes, you can go to medical school, yes, you could play in a competitive sport, you will be very surprised by what happens. And so throughout that mid-period of my life, we began to see the lifting of more of those barriers through example and through legislative change. And what began to happen is people began to see the difference. I came into politics in the early 1980s. I, was a, 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 I studied law, I had, was a political scientist, and incidentally, the reason why I gave up academia was through a very interesting example of sexism where I applied for a job and people managed to lose my application and I only discovered after that I had not even been, been considered for a job uh, when I was a student of one of the world's leading scholars. So if they'd interviewed me, I'd have never known. But I finally decided that I needed to do, do something else and I studied law. And when I was at law school, I, my first year of law school, I ran for the school board in Vancouver. And that's when I discovered that I really loved public life and that I enjoyed the, the, the cut and thrust of politics. I had the temperament for it. I wasn't too disturbed when people yelled at me. I understood that was part of democracy. But I loved the challenge of trying to solve problems and serve people. And, uh, and so that was my, my beginning in, in, in public life. But all this time, the world was gradually changing and there were a lot of struggles. When I was in law school, I used to write and direct the show that we put on every year. And the theme of the show we did in second year was about the appointment of a woman dean at the law school, which was hilariously funny and made a great show. But shortly after I graduated from law school, UBC appointed its first female dean. There are now, it's now got another woman dean, I don't know, they've had half a dozen since I was at law school. But these were changes that were starting to be made. And what has come out of that is that there is now a body of women and women's careers and women's participation, whether it's in the business world or in politics or in nonprofits or in academia, that can be studied and analyzed and judged. And the result of that has been, I think, a profound change to the conversation about women in our society. So I'll give you an example. When I was uh, teaching at the Kennedy School, I taught a course called Gender and Power. Now I got into this issue because of my own perplexity at things that I'd experienced when I was Prime Minister. Um, the way I was treated you know, by the media, but just, I mean, just weird things about it. I mean, nobody's happy how they're treated by the media. And I discovered a whole body of research on social and cognitive psychology that was being developed in the 1990s. 
about cognitive biases, about implicit attitudes, and why the way we think we think isn't really how we think. How we have very powerful implicit attitudes, so that even if consciously we think that we accept something like we think it's a great idea to have a woman prime minister, implicitly this flies in the face of what we're used to, the kinds of understanding that we have absorbed from the landscape of our life through most, most of our life. And therefore, that dissonance disturbs us, and we need to find some way to, to rectify it. So there were all these kinds of, of, of research talking about what was really, really happening, research on what really happened when candidates of different sexes applied for the same same jobs and you've all heard about gazillions of studies where people would send out the same resume and it would have Jennifer on one and John on the other and they get back totally different evaluations from the same people for the same resume. So all of this sort of stuff. But the other thing that's been very interesting was looking at the impact of women's inclusion. Because I want to talk about the value of what happened here a hundred years ago, what it started. It wasn't a revolution but it was a gradual change in how we understand the role that women can and must play in society. So, when I was teaching my Gender and Power course, I found wonderful research about the impact of having women in legislatures. Women are more likely than men to work across party lines, and we see that when women are in legislative bodies, the agenda changes that issues that are not normally dealt with do begin to be dealt with, particularly issues relating to, to families and children, but other things as well. So women have an impact on the agenda. And what is interesting is that in doing so, they very often bring their male colleagues along as well. It's not something that women are fighting this battle uh, in the face of, of recalcitrant men. No, they change the way their male colleagues think. And I had an interesting example of that when I was Justice Minister and I was legislating uh, my rape shield legislation when the Supreme Court of Canada struck down the old bill and I was re-legislating. Uh, and sexual assault is a very sensitive issue. Women are, live in the fear of it. They are often afraid to uh, make a complaint and men do not want to be falsely accused of it. So these questions about consent and no means no are very sensitive to both sides. But what I found was in the process of developing that legislation that many of my male colleagues were very interested and became very strong supporters of the bill. When women are in an environment, when they're part of a culture, their voices, their perspectives broaden the perspectives of the men that they are working with, that they add something to the conversation. And so when the chair of the department says, well, what, is, what difference does it make? It makes a big difference because women often ask different questions. They're concerned about different issues. And I remember, I told the story in my book when we were dealing with the issue, I don't know if you recall, but in 1988, uh, that was the year I was elected to parliament. And it was early in that year was the, the Morgenthaler decision where the stream, Supreme Court of Canada had struck down the abortion provisions in the criminal code. And Prime Minister Mulroney decided that we should that there needed we needed to re-legislate. And when I first went into, into Parliament, I was a junior minister of Indian Affairs, and the cabinet had created a committee and they couldn't come up with anything, and there was a great deal of toing and fro, and they couldn't come up with any idea. And then a year later, uh, the Prime Minister says, and you are the new Minister of Justice, and the good news is you're the new Minister of Justice, the bad news is you just inherited the abortion file. And Anyway, to make, to make a long story short, we were you know, trying to figure out how we could legislate something that wouldn't alienate everybody uh, that we represented. But we were sitting in cabinet one day and one of my colleagues made some comment about birth control. In fact, I think this was even before I became justice minister. This is when I was still a junior minister. Because I didn't, you know, I was in the big cabinet and you know, I didn't talk all that much there. And he said, you know, well, you know, we really need to do, do more about birth control and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, it's not as simple as it seems. You know, birth control is not a, a totally, you know, accurate, I mean, it's not a foolproof thing. And I talked about my own experience, and I won't go into it here, but about how each thing, you know, that, you know, intrauterine devices, they scar your fallopian tubes, and I was too old to take the pill, and you know, a diaphragm is good, but not if it's in the drawer, and a lot of men don't like to use condoms, and we know what we call people who use the rhythm method, we call them parents. So, 
I just was saying that, that, you know, yes, it's very important to do this, but, you know, it's a little more complicated than it seems. And after that meeting, several of my male colleagues came up to me and said, well, thank you. You know, our wives never talk to us like this, and we don't have a clue. And I thought, you know, it matters. I thought, why am I sitting at that table as a woman who understands this if I don't share that? And so the presence of women in these deliberative bodies really does change things, and there's a lot of wonderful research that shows that. There's American research that shows that as, that as little as one woman judge on a court can change the culture of that court. When I became Minister of Justice, I was the first woman Minister of Justice in Canada, and happily now there's a third woman Minister of Justice in Canada who's also the first First Nations Minister of Justice. But when I became Justice Minister, it was a big deal. And I remember going home to Vancouver after I was sworn in and how excited people were. And I thought, I need to do something that marks this change and that makes use of it. So I convened a, a, a national symposium on women law and the administration of justice in Vancouver. And what was interesting was we went out and we talked to stakeholders across the country and let them set the agenda. But we were able to invite a number of judges and the judges will come because if the Minister of Justice is hosting the event, they know that their independence will be protected. And after the, 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 the symposium, a number of the judges said to me, before I came to this conference, I thought I was pretty liberal on these issues. And I realized I didn't know anything because they had never heard from women themselves who had problems with the justice system and the law as it was applied and drafted, what their concerns were. And it was a revelation to them, not because they were mean and narrow-minded before, they weren't, but because they'd never heard those voices. So as women have become, become participants, have become players, they have changed the agenda and they have also demonstrated their efficacy. It's very interesting that in the days when I was a young woman, young professional, you know, people say, well, we need to get more women on corporate boards. And men would say, oh, well, you know, yes, dear, that's a great idea. And we just love to have you. But what do we tell our shareholders? You know, it's all about the bottom line. And we can't just have people because we think it would be great to have you on the board. Nowadays, enough women have served on corporate boards that the research shows that when you have women in senior management and on your boards, you have a higher return on investment. You have lower uh, dangerous risks. Um, and different board, boards behave better. You know, women, maybe because they're not secure being on boards, women actually read the board material. And this has a remarkable effect on the male members of the board who realize that maybe they better read the board material too. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's just because the women don't take their positions for granted. But now, the question is totally changed. So instead of saying, well, why, you know, we couldn't really have you because of our bottom line. Now the question is, given what the research shows in the improved performance of companies that have women in senior management and on their boards, how do you justify not having any women in your senior management or on your board. And you have companies like you know, Credit Suisse coming out and saying that the presence of women in senior management improves corporate performance. The Ontario Securities Commission has now come out with a comply or explain directive to Ontario registered companies. In other words, comply with the demand to put women on your boards or explain why you're not doing it. Norway has a wonderful way of doing quotas, they say, that no board can have fewer than 40% uh, fewer than of either gender. So you can't have 80% women either. You have to have a balance. So the point I'm saying is that over the years, there has been a lot of struggle. And there still are a lot of issues to resolve. But because women did struggle, and because they insisted on doing what they knew they could do, Many hearts were broken. Not every woman who wanted to make a career in business or wanted to make a career in the professions got an offer to, opportunity to do that. But enough did so that their performance has been evaluated. And the story is incredibly positive. So for young women today 
It's not that there still aren't barriers. There are. There are male-dominated cultures and places like the financial world, etc. But there is no longer any doubt about their ability to do the job. So it's a different conversation. And there's much more that we need to do. And we know that bias takes many forms. It's interesting, I am the founding principal of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College at the University of Alberta. And we bring in speakers to, uh, as, uh, to add to the modules that we're talking about in different dimensions um, in a Foundations of Leadership course. And we had one module where we're talking about diversity, a lot on gender diversity, a lot on ethnic diversity, a lot on the theories of why diversity is important, why it actually matters to have different points of view, why you get better decisions. But it's not something that you just bring people together and stir. You have to actually have mechanisms for making sure that people can express their views and they can contribute. But we had a public presentation and we brought in three people for a panel that we called uh, you know, Barriers to Participation. One of them was Dr. Arya Sharma, who's an expert on obesity. And there's an enormous amount of discrimination against people who have obesity, and yet we know that it's, it's a, 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 a problem that people deal with very difficult. It's nobody really understands it, and yet there's a lot of, uh, of, of bias based on it. We had somebody who was an expert on speech deficits. People who have speech problems, whether it's stuttering or other kinds of difficulties uh, expressing themselves, and those difficulties often have no relationship whatsoever to the intellectual capacities of the person. And the third person was a woman called Kelly Fallardo, who's from Edmonton, and when she was a child, she had burns over 75% of her body. And although over the years, surgeries have, you know, actually she's a very attractive looking woman, but she talks about the challenge of disfigurement. In other words, there are many ways that we need to see how people get excluded, how people don't become part of the conversation. But women have made huge, huge strides. They've made huge advances in changing that conversation and in dispelling this notion that they don't belong. Many categories within women, within men, uh, are, are categories of people who still struggle to be recognized. But as we come to break down those barriers, it perhaps creates a mindset of less hubris, more willingness to ask questions, more willingness to think, am I making a fair judgment? Am I making an, a, a judgment based on implicit attitudes because I've never accepted people like that as being part of my environment? So 100 years ago, when the Manitoba legislature empowered women in this province to vote and participate in government. They started, or they took, a very important step in beginning to create the social changes that have resulted in the opportunities that we have today, that have resulted in the richness of human conversation that we have today. And if you think of this museum, I think many of us here can imagine a time when it would have been very difficult to build this museum and to have the exhibits that it has. Because we lived in a society where people did not want to confront those forms of exclusion, when they did not want to confront those historical injustices, when they did not want to confront the fact that the vision they had of Canada was not the vision that applied to everybody. And so, Women have been in many ways the canary in the mine, and I just want to conclude by saying that what we have achieved in our own country, and we still work to achieve, also has influence outside of our country. A number of years ago, I was talking to Louise Arbour when she was the chief war crimes prosecutor in The Hague, and we all know her, she served on the Supreme Court of Canada. And they had just declared systemic rape to be a war crime. And I said to her, that's really extraordinary. I think that's really quite excellent because we knew that you know, there were these conflicts where people were deliberately destroying communities by, by raping women and knowing that, that it would break down the communities. And she said, but we couldn't do it without the changes that countries like Canada and others made in their domestic law. When they make changes in their domestic law, that helps to change the international norm and so there's a kind of a dialectic between what progressive countries do in their legislation in terms of empowering, in terms of breaking down barriers, and what can be done globally and internationally. 
And so it isn't just in our own country that these changes resonate. They, they resonate around the world. And what is interesting is that I didn't become the first woman Secretary General of the United Nations. But two weeks ago, I was in New York at the invitation of the President of the General Assembly to participate in a very high-level retreat to talk about the appointment of the next Secretary General because Ban Ki-moon's term is up at the end of this year. And no, I wasn't there as a potential candidate. But I was there as part of a discussion about what kind of a person. And what is interesting is there's a very strong acceptance. And we had representatives from all the, from the, we had the ambassadors of most of the P5 and senior people in the UN. There is a general acceptance that if possible, a female candidate is to be preferred. So that here we are, in 2016, 100 years after that breakthrough down the street, looking at a preferred candidate for one of the most difficult jobs there is in the world. I mean, being Secretary General of the UN is like being a, given a gun with no bullets. I mean, you have no power and you have to use all these other skills to do the job. But that the, it is preferred in the international community that that person be a woman. So every person who has worked to empower women, to change the law, to stand up for women, to support women, and to change our values has contributed to that. And it is something. We know that the status of women is the single most important indicator of the human development index of any country. That social, political, and human development of a country can be judged relative to other countries quickly by looking at the status of women. So we are no longer just the canaries in, in the mind, the mine. We are the symbol of what countries want to, want to achieve and how important it is that women get the opportunity to be everything they can be. So thank you, Manitoba. Congratulations on this wonderful milestone. And I hope all of you are celebrating this great 100th anniversary of a major step, not just for women in Manitoba, but for women in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words of inspiration. And I'm sure there may be some questions. So we're gonna allow for about 15 minutes of question and answer. We have Ria in the back corner of the room with a mic. Alors nous avons Ria dans le coin qui va être là avec le microphone. And we're also accepting questions from social media from people who are following us online. And Ria will be answering those questions online. So if you have a question, do we have one from social media that could start us off, Ria? I saw one um, that is uh, related to one of the Caribbean um, women who left the field. And what do you imagine would have happened when you were Prime Minister had you tried to achieve one of the Caribbean values? Well, first of all, I didn't have a new election, so my choice was difficult. I don't think I could have done it. And I think when he said it's 2015, I think a lot has happened since then to make the idea of gender parity much more acceptable. In 2005, uh, Jose uh, Luis Zapatero Rodriguez in, in Spain ran for prime minister, promised he'd have a gender parity cabinet, never thinking he was gonna be elected. He got elected and he delivered. So this is, I think Canada is about the fifth to do that. And I think, I don't think I could have done it. I tried to, to advance women and I would have continued to, but I'm not sure that I would have been able to do it unless I had a lot more women in caucus. So sometimes men can get away with doing things that women would find harder to do, but I think it's great. Should throw you my mic. 
if you heard the question, uh, when I became prime minister, what major barriers did I encounter, encounter and how did I overcome them? I think there were many ways in which I had a lot of support. I had support from the, the public service and things that I tried to do. But I think my greatest barrier was the implicit attitudes of people, particularly the Ottawa Press Gallery who had covered politics for a long time, where there simply wasn't time to establish myself and to you know, create the kind of you know, new government that I wanted to do. But I think that what I came to understand later when I looked at the, the psychological research is that for the people that covered Ottawa politics all the time, the shift to a woman prime minister was much more traumatic than it was for journalists out in the, the regions. When I came to Winnipeg, people were much more concerned with what was my view about rural depopulation, what was my view of the wheat board, what was my view of issues that related to this part of the country. And, I, and why I got into that research was because I had so many experiences that just perplexed me that I couldn't understand it. But later I came to realize that if somebody thinks I don't belong, no reporter wanted to say, oh, you know, I don't think a woman should be prime minister. That would be politically incorrect. But if I didn't look or sound like anybody who'd done that job before and they were uncomfortable, they needed to find a way to validate that discomfort. And so, for example, I never said that an election was not the time to talk about serious issues. And what really annoyed me was as I was talking about serious issues from dawn till dusk. But there was a reporter who wanted to get me, and he, he, he set it up by saying, you know, you have a hidden agenda on social programs. And I said, well, no, I don't. And in fact, I met with all the premiers before I went to G7 and said we wouldn't make any changes reflecting social programs without cons consulting the provinces. Because I had actually, I, I was not just the first woman prime minister, I was the first to have served at all three levels of government. And I understood how at the provincial level, it's aggravating when you have programs that you're responsible for and the federal government changes the rules and they don't have to deliver the program. So I said, you know, and I, you know, I've committed to the provinces that I wouldn't do without consulting. And he said, well, you know, shouldn't you be, you know, you know without negotiating with these, well, shouldn't you be doing that now? And I said, no, it's just not the time to have those conversations. You know, to talk about those issues, meaning it's not the time to be doing federal provincial negotiations on social programs. And when he went back to the bus, the two of the women who were at the bus said, he, he said, we got her, we got her. And they said, well, you know, that's not what she meant. Well, we got her. And of course, once one reporter reports that, the others all have to, because their editors say, well, you know, if he says that she said that, why aren't you saying that? And, and, and it was frustrating for me, but I realized after, I mean, I think the guy is an ass, but I, he is an understandable ass because he was one of the people who, he once said to me with his lip curling, you know, and I've covered every prime minister since Lester Pearson. And the clear implication was, and you don't look or sound like any of them. So it's that discomfort, and that was the hardest thing. And I think had I had more time, in addition to being able to put out a more fleshed out program for people to, to, to judge, I would have had more time for people to get used to me, for better or for worse. And it may have you know, simply entrenched some people's views that I you know, didn't meet their, their view of what a prime minister should be. But for others, the novelty of it would have worn off and they could have looked at what we were doing. But that was just the reality that I dealt with because of the time. And, but it was interesting later to have the opportunity to try and understand what was going on so that I didn't take it so personally. I just saw it as something interesting to understand and to share with people because implicit attitudes can very much get in our way. And we all have them. We all have them, uh, not just reporters. We all have them, and they can get in our way of making good judgments. We have another question over here. Well, you know, culture is a very deep thing, and I think there have been dramatic shifts in people's attitude towards women in some parts of the world. And there still are parts of the world where women are property. Um, what is interesting is that I would say now that an organization like the United Nations is much more explicitly invested in the equality of women. 
uh, much less willing to say, well, it's a, you know, a country's choice. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights engages that, that value. But many, in many societies, there are very, very traditional societies that are honor societies where the status of a family depends upon the behavior of females in that family. And those changes are not going to come about, come about quickly, but I think it's important to point out that in some countries where women really are property, uh, and I think of you know countries like like Iran, um, they weren't all, they haven't always been like that. There have been changes. So in the same way as in, in in Canada, you know there are some people who are less supportive of women than others. But I think the the arc of history is moving in that direction. And what is great is that it has. Um, reality and empirical knowledge to support it. Because many of the countries where women are struggling for equality are economically uh, depressed countries. And all of the advice that they are getting around the world and how they can develop themselves and raise the level, the standard of living of their people is that they have to educate women, they have to educate women and girls. And they have to provide opportunities for women to participate fully in society that a country that is not educating girls is a country that will never pull itself out. So it is also helpful to have those kinds of arguments because you're not then addressing somebody's cultural values uh, so directly. But I think it's also something that we need to think about in Canada because Canada ranks, uh, there was just a, a study that was put out, we rank number three in terms of what is the best country in the world to be a woman. I think Denmark was one and I forget, was it Sweden too? I can't remember. But many of the countries from which we take immigrants are countries that come down at the bottom. So people come to Canada from places where women don't have the same stature, they don't have the same um, ease of aspiration of fulfilling it. And it's not that we shouldn't bring such people to our country, but we need to realize that there's a cultural shock there. Uh, and that things that we take for granted may be things that are quite perplexing or horrifying or disturbing to other people. So we have to really, continue to articulate our vision of what we mean by gender equality and the rights of women, um, even in our own society, in order to, to protect it. But it, on the other hand, when people come to Canada from countries where women don't have the same opportunities, and they discover what they can do, and the girls go to school and they do things, later on, when these people interact with their, their countries of origin or they go back, they become the ambassadors for a different set of values uh, about the value of girls and women and what they can contribute to society. So I think, again, there's that uh, two-way relationship that helps to, to change those ideas. But I think, uh, I think we've come a long way, but I think some old attitudes are, are hard, to, hard to change. And some of them are supported by certain kinds of you know, dogmatic views that, that come from particular philosophies or religions looking at the world. Less and less so, but it's still there. We have an online question from Philip. Any comments on the online vitriol on sexism directed against female politicians and its impact on women considering public life? I think the impact of that vitriol on women considering public life is sadly negative. But the thing about, um, I, I have a Twitter account, A. Kim Campbell, if you want to find me, A. And the thing about, I don't get a lot of vitriol, but I get some, and sort of like, and who were you when you were prime minister for two seconds, and why are you shooting your mouth off, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, you know, far. <laughs> Anyhow, but the reason is that it's, it's anonymous, you know? And there are people, you know, there have always been people who get off at yelling at people who have their names in the paper. And, you know, when you can anonymously express this stuff, but I, I think the other thing, and I don't know whether it's true, but because I don't do this myself and nor does my husband, but people tell me that young kids see a, a lot of porn online. Now, when I was a kid, nobody saw porn. I mean, you know, there were magazines at the newsstand that were like way up in the back, you know, or somebody would get their father's Playboy. Or something. I mean, it was just, it wasn't something. And I think the problem with porn, I mean, whatever does it for you is fine by me, but the problem with the images and pornography is that they're very misogynist. And if people develop their attitudes towards women, 
by seeing that stuff, that could also be part of it. But I think it's also the anonymity that people, you know, would, would often, there was a wonderful thing on Twitter of a woman who discovered that her son was harassing these girls. So she dressed up like a young teenager and she walks down the street and her son gives her right, like a hoo-ha, whatever, and she turns around and he goes, mama, and she whaps him because, you know, what he was doing, he would never want his mother to know he was doing. And she caught him, it was very hilarious. So there's a lot of this, you know, nobody knows me, nobody sees me, and, you know, I'm gonna be, you know, obnoxious. And that's why you just have to ignore it. You know, LOL, people. And that does not mean lots of love, it means laugh out loud on Twitter. Okay, so we have a few questions at the back of the room, and then I have two hands over here to be acknowledged. You mentioned that most of the Well, you know, I, I'm inclined to be a bit more proactive. Um, a lot of, you know, it's interesting. When Nancy Hopkins at MIT discovered that women scientists were being seriously discriminated against, that their labs were way smaller than the, the young man and whatever, what she discovered is that the women scientists were very uncomfortable acknowledging the discrimination. It offended their sense of autonomy. And when people take proactive steps like a, a quota, or even like the Prime Minister saying, we're gonna do 50-50 in my cabinet, you know, irrespective of the actual balance in caucus, this is how I'm gonna do it. A lot of women, uh, because we so want to be recognized for what we can do, and we can do it. You know, you don't have to make allowances for us, we can do it. So the real question is, how do you make the breakthrough? How do you get proactive? One of the things that I've suggested is that in Canada, we simply create two member constituencies and elect a man and woman from each constituency. You'd have instant parity. You wouldn't have men and women fighting over nominations. And because you know we have had two member constituencies throughout Canada. I was elected in a two member constituency to the BC legislature when I was elected. Uh, I discovered when I was in the Maritimes last year that the Maritime provinces, uh, uh, PEI, I think in Nova Scotia, had two member constituencies that, that they used to use to accommodate the balance of Protestants and Catholics. So, you know, the Conservatives would nominate a Protestant and a Catholic for each riding. So if you voted Conservative, you got a Protestant and a Catholic. So why couldn't you do that for gender? And the point is that I think we do need to find some way of being proactive and not waiting for a million years for this to happen. Um, the problem with our system, our first pass the post system, our single member constituency riding, it's not the first past the post because you can elect them anyway, is that it's very hard for even the best intentioned party leader to say I'm gonna have a gender balanced uh, caucus because you don't know who's gonna get elected where. So I think doing something creative might be kind of fun and you could try it out for a few elections and if you didn't like it, you could change it. But um, I think, I'm, you know, I actually believe in evolution but not in when it comes to getting, you know, gender parity in parliament. I'm more for intelligent design. <laughs> so we have two more questions in the back and then I have two hands that I've acknowledged and a third and I think then we're gonna have to close the questions for this evening. Hello. Convention. Convention. 
yeah, I'm not sure how low I want to push the voting age, um, but I'm open to conversation. Um, I think, you know, when you say, what would I have done? Um, you know, I, I, I can't sort of talk in a hypothetical. I obviously, I'm deeply committed to the rights and the protection of children. Um, and, there are, and that takes many different forms or many different areas of the law that, that where that needs to be done. But I also think that if you had a parliament that was gender balanced, you might have a very different kind of debate about it. And not because women are nicer. I don't think women are nicer or they're better, but they're more knowledgeable about the raising of children and the reality of raising children. And I think they would, in the course of conversations with their male colleagues, not all of whom are out to lunch, au contraire, many men are quite knowledgeable. But I think you'd have a different kind of debate um, and maybe a greater willingness to reach out. When, when I was justice minister, um, I consulted with all sorts of people when I was doing revising the sexual assault law in the country, people that had not normally been included in Department of Justice consultations. And Anne McClellan, who is the second woman who was justice minister, is now a friend of mine in, in Edmonton, where I'm doing this project for the University of Alberta. And we were speaking together at a breakfast one morning, and she said that when she went to the department, they briefed her on the Campbell consultative model, which they were still using, which was much broader than what had traditionally been done, not just the usual you know, bar association, et cetera. But when I was doing sexual assault, we talked to women of color, we talked to women in the sex trade. We reached out much more broadly to get other people's voices. So I would like to think that if I had not had political retirement thrust upon me by the Canadian electorate, that um, <laughs> that mode of consultation would have been reflected in many of the things that we did. And I think, you know, the bottom line, you know, to develop wisdom on these issues is to listen to people. Uh, it's amazing what you can learn, and it's amazing how they can keep you from <laughs> going off the cliff. So I think there's a lot to be said about it, but I do think a more gender balanced, balanced parliament might give you a different quality of debate. Mine. Well, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think men are the villain, you know. Some men are villains, yes, but not all of them. But by the time I became a member of Parliament, a lot of those battles had been won because there was now a reasonably critical mass of women. So when I stood in the House to speak, the sound of a woman's voice was no longer unusual. But imagine when you were in Parliament when there were, you were the first woman or the only woman or there were one or two women. And you just would stand out so much, you'd be so different. And Parliament really was kind of a men's club. By the time I got there, I found my colleagues uh, in the Mulroney government very supportive, very helpful. Now, I had one colleague who said to me that he had a candidate in his uh, uh, province that he thought would be an excellent judge, but that clearly he'd have to have a sex change operation from before I would appoint him, which was a bit of an overstatement, you know. Competence will be plenty, thank you. But so I had a few of that. But I, you know, I think you're right, and you know, I think you, there are, you know when sexism is diminishing you, and when somebody who makes a comment that you may think is kind of sexist, but where the attitude behind it is not hostile. And you learn to work in these cultures. And sometimes you can do it, and sometimes I like women in the financial industry often find it very, very difficult because just the level of testosterone that's going is very bad. But it also means that there's a lot of risk taking. And you know, after the big financial meltdown in 2008, uh, the big discussion at Davos was, you know, what would happen if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Sisters? And the conclusion was it would probably be better if it were Lehman Brothers and Sisters because you know it would have been a different balance. So there are some workplaces where that's a more uh, 
soul-destroying experience than others. But yeah, I think, you know, I, don't, I never go into anything on the assumption that I'm dealing with the enemy. But I also understand if I'm going into something that's been a particular kind of culture, and I, either because I'm a woman or I'm a Westerner or I'm whatever, am representing something new. And I think that what I discovered, it's interesting, when I ran for leadership of the party, I had an enormous amount of caucus support, and I had caucus support from people who hated my legislation. You know, gun control, abortion, gay rights, the real easy issues. And people who were opposed to it, and they were standing, Don Blinkhorn, who was, you know, just against everything I did, and he's standing and saying, oh, I'm supporting Kim because she's tough, but she's fair. And I thought, who to thunk it? that you can have arguments with people and people can have different views, but if you treat people with respect and you don't go in always with guns blazing, now there are times when you gotta blaze your guns, there are times when people really are awful. But I think that a lot of women who do well in working in environments where women haven't been present a lot, it's not just that they become one of the guys, it's that they just kind of you know, understand that there's something new and that they need to, through respect and good and, and goodwill, let people discover how much they like having them there. So uh, that's probably not very helpful to you. But um, but I, I did not suffer terribly when I went to Parliament, because other women had gone before me, and my colleagues were quite comfortable to have a woman. Thank you. We have um, two last questions, and then we're going to be closing the Q and A for this evening. You know, I can't speak for the current government, but we all see what we see. And all of us are guilty of being blind to people in our environment, of not seeing them, of not according them what they need. That's the human condition and we need to know it. And I, and, in my leadership college, one of the things we're, we're trying to make students aware of is that we all do this, and if we want to lead effectively, we need to find ways of seeing. Um, and I mean, I don't have an easy answer for your question, but I think it's very, I know what it's like to be not seen for being a female in certain circumstances. And not in a lot, because I was a pushy young thing, but I've seen it and I've experienced it. And I think one of the things we need to do is, as a society, is as part of our education and part of our understanding, is come to terms with the fact that as human beings, we tend to be tribal, we tend to self-replicate, we tend to see the landscape that is the landscape that formed us and often don't see, I don't know if you watch Downton Abbey, but in the last episode, a former housemaid comes to lunch and one of the daughters said, you know, this is terrible that we didn't recognize you. And Daisy says, well, you know, they never looked us in the face. There's a lot of 
not looking people in the face and not seeing and not recognizing. And I don't have a simple answer, but I would say that a multicultural society and a diverse society does not succeed just by virtue of inertia. It does take effort. It does take work. It does take the investment of time and energy uh, and resources to take people who come to your society and ensure that they find a place and that they have a role in the society. It's not, it's not just stir and it works out. So when people in our society don't, are not, we're not acknowledging them, we're not seeing them, or they don't get a chance to feel that they're heard, we need to figure out how to do that. And sometimes you can do that through local government, whatever. But if we want to succeed as a multicultural society, it's not going to happen on autopilot. We have to understand that, that it is a challenge because of who we are, all of us, every single one of us. You know, we, we want to do things well, but we're all products of our own culture and environment. And, we need, and some of us are, are not. Some of the people are wonderfully more stretched and open. But it doesn't happen without work. And I'm sorry, that's not a very good answer to your question. Thank you. And one final question. Well, I don't want to get a discussion about the governments, what they did, but I would say this. Again, the voices of women make a difference in understanding reality. And anybody who thinks that contraception is not a vital instrument for helping women to get control of their lives in places where they are struggling to earn a living and where you're struggling to help them, I think is very naive and very counterproductive and ultimately destructive. There are people who have religious resistance to the notion of contraception. I'm not one of them. And I think it's, it's very vital. But again, I think, like the conversation that we had in that cabinet meeting, you would be amazed how many men are just clueless because it's not an issue. The challenge of your fertility is something a woman deals with from the day she reaches puberty until the day she's absolutely sure that menopause is done. And there are a lot of, you know, menopause babies out there. People thought, oh, I thought I was, no, I guess not, okay. Um, you know, it is a reality it is the reality of life as women live it, and we understand it. And much of my life I spent either trying not to get pregnant or trying to get pregnant. You know, I mean, it is part of your life. Uh, and if you don't live it, 
I'm not sure you really understand it. And that's why we need those voices. We need women to be there and not, and one woman can't represent all women. You know, I used to say I'm a white middle class, university educated baby boom woman from Vancouver. I cannot speak for every woman in Canada. That's why I had to go out and talk to women who weren't like me. And that I think is integral. There are a lot of these issues where the, the people who are having the conversations are not the people who are engaged in the issue. I saw a picture of the negotiations for Syri peace in Syria. Not a woman in the room. Now the UN has passed a resolution saying that all processes for peace and security need to involve women. I did a project in the Horn of Africa where I worked with these incredibly brave women in the Horn of Africa in these uh, you know, post-conflict situations trying to get their governments to include them because you know what, if you don't include them, the peace agreements fall apart. But it's, it's, that's what we need to do. And if governments fail, and you know, and the interesting thing is, you know, I, I don't know Stephen Harper very well, but I don't think he's a sexist. I think he's actually quite supportive of women. But I think he had an environment in his cabinet where people certainly didn't talk up like I did in Brian Mulroney's cabinet, talking about intrauterine devices and, you know, diaphragms and people going, oh. Um, but, you know, but I felt I could do it. And I think so you, there has to, you have to, a leader has to create an environment in which people, you not only hear different voices, but those people can speak in their own voice. And they don't feel they have to be one of the boys or that people will laugh at them. You know, if they say tampon, you know, in the context of we should not be charging sales tax on tampon, you know. So, but the only way to do it is to be there. And it's not that men cannot do justice to women's issues. Many men do. And I don't want to insult them by saying that. But they can't do it as well as we can do it when we're can there you, leading the charge. Can you see a woman Now that's a high-class hook, if I ever heard. <laughs> well, before the lights shut off, <laughs> and we spend the night at the museum, we're just going to wait for the announcement to finish. Some of you may remember that I was known as the master of the 30-minute soundbite. <laughs> Alors, merci, Madame Campbell. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think on behalf of the museum, we'd just like to thank you as well for your generosity with the question and answer period and for inspiring us and also all those who've been able to join us on the live stream. So please join me in warming, warmly thanking the Right Honourable Kim Campbell. Merci, uh, bonsoir. Uh, please visit the museum's website for future programming. Uh, this year we are going to be focusing on reconciliation, uh, disability rights and women's rights, so there'll be a lot of other conversations and opportunities to engage in these issues over the year. Thank you. Merci.